Welcome to episode four of the Pull Up a Chair podcast. My name is Ryan Smallwood, the pastor of Aldersgate Church. Remember, we may not all think alike, but we can all love alike. And the thoughts and opinions that are shared here today on this podcast may not necessarily reflect my thoughts and opinions, nor those of Aldersgate Church. Having said that, we're going to take a little detour with uh, this uh, this release of this podcast, episode four, and uh, I've got some great friends here with me. Um, this is Jeff and Leanne Fisher, or I'm going to say it right, Jeff. This is Jeff and Dr. Fisher. Dr. Fisher. And so um, why don't you guys just introduce yourselves to us and uh, let us know a little bit about yourselves, maybe what you do, that kind of thing, and uh, then we'll go from there. Um, my name is Leanne Fisher, and I uh, work at Central Office for Friendship ISD. Yeah, that's why I said Doctor Fisher because like she's 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 way up there. So no, no, no. no. <laughs> and my name is Jeff. I'm one of the owners of Daybreak Coffee. Your coffee here at the church, and I've actually been a member here. I'm on my twentieth year. Twenty Woo-hoo. years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, you guys have been around Aldersgate for a long time, yep. and. Um, Man, these guys have been friends of mine for a long time, and uh, it, it's great to have them on the podcast today and get to, to share this story. Um, this is We're taking a break and a detour with the podcast today because this is just such an incredible story that, that we want to share. And um, when we thought of all the different ways we could share it, we thought we really weren't going to do justice and we, unless we had time to share the whole story. So, um, man, this has been a journey for you guys that started almost a year ago. So, a little over a year ago. A little yeah. over a year ago. So... Um, man, Jeff, just, I don't know, just jump in and start telling us, telling us okay. the story. And I brought Leanne with me to fill in the holes. Cause I, I don't know the whole story. <laughs> I, I, was, I was there, but I don't know all of it. You, you don't, you don't remember all of it. I don't it. remember all of it. Um, as a backstory, I, uh, I run, I love to run. I've been, I've ran about 10 marathons now and that actually started through the church, but that's a whole nother story. Yeah. It was like the world vision thing, yes. right? Uh, running with several years vision. ago, uh, the, the church was doing a run for world vision. I'd never ran. I think I'd run one 10 K in my life and decided to jump in for a full marathon. And, and then the story goes and I've ran 10 more since then, but so I'm in great health. I never had any problems. I haven't been to a doctor and I didn't even have a, a personal doctor or anything when this happened, but, um, but that's not cause you're in great health. That's just cause you're a guy and guys don't go to that's the doctor. True, that's true. It could, it could be. <laughs> um, in March of in late March of 2019, I was on a work trip. I uh, had to go from San Angelo to uh, Brownwood to Dallas, and I was going to be in Dallas for the week. Um, when I left, I, f- I had hit my head earlier that day, and some she can fill in the story there. But you know, I, I just felt off. I didn't really know what the deal was, but I felt off. Um, so I headed out, went to San Angelo. I'm way between San Angelo and Brownwood. I started having a sharp pain in uh, like the back of my shoulder blade on my right side. It got to the point that I almost spent the night in Brownwood and cut my uh, trip short. I talked to her. I was going to stay in Brownwood with her brother, um, but ended up driving on to Dallas. Um, this is where it gets all kind of foggy, but uh, the next day I, I thought, I mean, I, I really thought something was just wrong with my back. So I went to a chiropractor. He thought I had a rib dislocated. Um, he popped the rib back into place. And, you know, I thought I'd get better, but I never really, never really got better. Um, she talked to my partner, who's a pilot, and, you know, told him that I just wasn't right. So he flew to Dallas um, that day or the next day. Um, at that point, I was mad. I was mad that she, like, told on me, like, <laughs> I didn't want help. Again, I'm a guy. I didn't want help. Um, he got there. He stayed the day. Um my symptoms got worse and worse. I, uh, I started to lose my voice. Um, I finally convinced him to come back to Lubbock and told him I'd stay and you know, finish my work in, in Dallas. Um, I guess one day later, I, uh, I got to the point where I couldn't talk at all. I completely lost my voice. Um, some weird things happened that night that we can leave out of this podcast. But uh, let's say I had some battles that night. Um, the next two nights I spent in a hotel room and really never left. Um, I think I went out one day to get some medicine, some uh, just cold medicine. I mean, I really just thought I had a cold. You know, there's no way this was real. Um, that last day I woke up, um, the bed was soaked with sweat. Um, I was freezing. Um, I remember hopping in the shower just to, I had the water on cold. Just I, I was freezing, but I was hot. I mean, I can't even explain the different stuff going on. I, I yeah. couldn't talk at all. And you're all alone in this hotel room. I'm all alone in the hotel room. I'm, I'm there with, I'm supposed to be there that weekend. I was staying that weekend to go to opening day at uh, um, a Rangers game. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, this is 
March 30th, what, yeah. Yeah, the last end of March. And Leanne, you're back home trying to manage all of this over the phone. I am. So I, I tried to, um, uh, we talk every day when he's out of town like this. We always talk, usually even FaceTime. And so I, I knew, obviously, I knew something was wrong, but um, I think it was a Thursday. I tried to talk with him, and he wouldn't answer my phone calls. And I'm like, you know, what's going on? And he would text me right away of, you know, I'm fine. I just can't talk right now. Hmm. And then again on Friday, he wouldn't. Um, he finally, I think, picked up the FaceTime, um, and I could see right away he wasn't okay. Something wasn't right, but he, again, doesn't really have a voice or anything. So um, Saturday is the day he was supposed to go to, to the Ranger game, um, and he didn't leave the hotel, but he also wouldn't talk, wasn't really texting. So it was very nerve-wracking. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. So I have to get back somehow, though. So I finally decided to drive back to Lubbock. And I uh, had to stop in Abilene on the way to do a little bit of work there. And so I hopped in a car <laughs> with, I couldn't talk. I, who knows what my temperature was. And I decided to drive back to Lubbock. I should have died in the hotel. I should have died in that car ride, but somehow I made it home. But I remember when I walked in, and that whole drive back's a fog. That hotel's even a fog. I've been back there since then, and by accident, not on purpose. But I've been back since then. I don't remember anything, any of the surroundings at all. I don't. Mm. It's just all a fog. Um, but when I got back to the house, I remember the first thing I said to her, I mean, I broke down. I was just like, I didn't think I'd ever see you again. And I think I kind of shocked her then. And at the time, I just wanted to sleep, and she just would not leave me alone. <laughs> um, going back to the point of not being sick, we didn't have a thermometer at the house. Yeah. So she went out and bought a thermometer, and when she came home, I think my temperature was at 104. <laughs> Am I leaving out some stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes he comes home and and like you said as soon as he walked in the door he was in tears and just hugging me and um kind of you know kind of holding on pretty good and um uh so he lays down shortly later and as he's laying down i can see he's he's shivering but i can see that he's sweating um and as he's sleeping like i can just tell he's not breathing well like he's very shallow hmm. uh, very shallow breathing and so um, I woke him up and, and had him take some Tylenol because I knew, you know, I knew he was running a fever. Um, but like he said, we don't have, I mean, our kids are grown, so we don't keep a thermometer in the house anymore, really. Um, so I had him take, uh, take some Tylenol and, and fed him a sandwich just to get something down him. Um, and uh, he, he laid back down and, and rested a little more. And a couple hours later, he woke back up and, uh, I mean, just not any better. You can just tell he's just still in, in bad shape. And I can tell he's still running a fever and um, Tylenol didn't seem to do anything to help. And uh, so at that point, that's when I left and, and went and bought a thermometer and came home and um, took, took his temperature and it was about 104. And so, you know, right away, it's things are not good. Um, and I had called his mom on the way to get the thermometer, and I'm like, look, I don't know what's, what's wrong, but I know he's not good, but he is home. Um, and so she's encouraging me to get him to the doctor. I'm like, I've already tried. He's refusing, you know, and she's like, I don't care what you do. So I got back to the um, to the house and, um, again, took his temperature, and, and once I saw it, it was 104. I was like, we're going. We're going to the doctor right now. And um, he finally agreed um, to go, uh, but he's like, we just can't go to the emergency. I was not going to the ER. There was no way in the world I was going to the ER. Night, so. I'm perfectly fine. I'm not going to the ER. Mm-hmm. So we go to Star ER, and they do some uh, scans and stuff there, and the lady tells me uh, that I shouldn't be walking. I definitely shouldn't. Be, I mean, my voice is bad anyway, but that I, I shouldn't be standing there in front of her. And then I'm going to the hospital that night, and I was like, do, do what? <laughs> So they, uh, so I was ambulanced straight from there to the hospital. And she told you there too that you were going to have to have surgery. I said my, che- my chest was going to be cracked open, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So then as a runner, I mean, that's, you're telling me my, that's all over. You know, I'm done with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I was freaked out then. No, no, no joke, I was freaked out then. We get to the hospital. If you've never been to the emergency room of a hospital, I mean, I, I got to skip the entire waiting thing outside, but I'm stuck in what I can only describe as a dungeon. Yeah, let me just tell you, when they fast track you in the ER, that's yeah. not a good thing, right? <laughs> no, it's so. not a good thing. <laughs> but, you know, again, you know, you know nothing that's going on. And some of the first things that popped in my head was, how am I going to pay for this? You know, I mean, we have insurance. I've never had a file an inch. You know, there's just so many weird things that go through your head then. And, 
Yeah, it's on a Sunday. It's the middle of the night. It's about 2 o'clock in the it's morning. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. How much is all this costing me? I just want to go home. I just want to be left alone and go home. So they did some tests and stuff. Um, they really couldn't figure out what was wrong with me at first. Um, that whole first day was kind of a blur. Um, they were testing me for everything. I, I can tell you that I am cancer-free from <laughs> head to toe because I have poked and prodded and had every kind of test. And um, eventually I was... Uh, I can't remember why I was in the x-ray room, but at that point, some x-ray technician yelled TB, tuberculosis. And at that moment, everything shuts down. Um, everybody puts on these little duck-billed masks. I'm whisked away. And again, now I'm really freaked out because, I mean, everybody around me is, everybody around me is acting freaked out. I don't know why. I can't tell what's going on. Um, and then we were sent to another room that was a negative pressure room because at that point they think I have TB and until it's ruled out, you have TB. I think that's when you came up. I think you came up while I was in the negative pressure room that first night and you even asked me or you said, you know, I'm not afraid to touch you. And I specifically remember grabbing your hand. I knew, I didn't know what was wrong yet, but I knew it was right. It was somewhere in here. So I appreciate you coming up and doing that. Um, I think by then my parents were even there. You may want to t jump over here because now, from here on out, I'm I'm drugged up for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, your I called his parents as soon as we were at that emergency room or at the Star ER, and they told us that he, they were going to transfer him to the hospital. Um, so I called his parents and I was like, it's, "And they're it's, they're five-ish. They're yeah, they're in Tulsa. Yeah, five-ish hours away. Yeah. And so I called them. I was like, "It's not good. Um, it's not good at all." And so they got in the car right then and. Um, drove all night and, and came in. So um, while we're sitting in the uh, emergency room, I mean, like you said, it's, I mean, we're in the back, like the trauma room. So there are these massive rooms with, you know, just a, a litany of equipment and supplies in there. And it's just the two of us sitting there and um, we're in there for, for quite a while by ourselves. Um, um, and, and at that point, I mean, you left that whole part out, but at that point, that's really kind of when we started, um, just playing music just because I mean it's it's kind of a you know a, a dark dreary place to be um and when you're just alone and just the two of us and just our thoughts are going crazy um I just put some music on and so we started um just sitting there listening to music um I remember playing. it playing that that first time yeah. I, I came up to see you that there was music playing I mean I wasn't shocked by that but I just remember I remember the music I playing. first heard so a lot of this is going to be about Defender but I first heard Defender uh Francesca Balistelli, uh, Balistelli did a uh, concert here at uh, one of the other churches, um, Hillside. Hillside Church, in October before this happened. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I first heard the song then, didn't nothing really caught me. It was the song sounded good, and then Jessica sang in here probably two times before this happened. And I mean the song, it, I really liked the song, but then she started playing it there, and she was playing other songs too. But that song, I just I latched onto. Um, and it, I didn't know why at first, but uh, like in the middle of the night, I mean, they wake you up constantly to test you and stuff. I mean, because I was in the hospital a total of six weeks. Okay. Um, middle of the night, that song got played. Throughout the day, you're up for a procedure, that song got played. After a procedure, that song got played. Um, there were a couple of different times that Jessica would text Leanne and tell her they were going to sing it that Sunday. So we would watch church on a Sunday, you know, just to hear that, just to hear that song. Um, I had several ports put in and there was one day that Jessica was like, she started this song and they came in. <laughs> I was not happy, but, uh, I remember specifically that day it was this shoulder. Um, but you know, she even has to leave the room there. So we had to stop that day. Um, but D Defender was played constantly every, every day and night while I was there. And when she left, she would left, she would make sure I had my phone next to me. I mean, cause that's the first thing I'd reach for when I needed comfort or whatever to get, to get through whatever I was going through. Was there something particular in that song that really, or was it just, it was just that song or was there something particular with it or? So every single word of it. So when it starts off, you go before I go, um, before, before I even knew there was a battle, he was going before me. He, uh, years before he sent me to Kenya with the church, which introduced me to, uh, to Dr. Henderson, mm -hmm. which he came into play during this whole thing. Um, running probably saved my life in a Haram because of this church. Mm. Um, so that got my defender. God did a lot of stuff before to get, to get me through this before you even knew. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, I think it's, it's so amazing because it, it can be any song, but sometimes those lyrics just really grab us because they, um, they mean so much to us. And sometimes they take on new light when you go through something like this. And um, I, I knew that became one of your, one of your go-to places, one of your go-to songs when you, when you went through all of this. Um, just, just so that everybody who doesn't know your story. So, so tell us a little bit more about your hospital stay. What exactly happened? Uh, so I mean, I obviously in, you're here, you're healthy. I'm here so. and I'm healthy now. I'm great. Now, in fact, I've ran a marathon since then. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, so I, I was, I was let out, I think three different times. Um, they really couldn't figure out at first what was wrong. I had three different kinds of strep in my lungs. So, you know, you get strep throat. This is a right. different kind of strep. They did rule out TB. They rolled so out TB, rolled out so that was great. Yeah. Yeah. So everything's all, you know, we're all great and they, happy They let now. people yeah. actually come in yeah. and see you, and they didn't have to look like Martians coming That's in. That's right. right. So they, three kinds of strep in my, in my lungs, but they didn't know how it got there. And so the doctors thought that it got through through a cracked tooth. So I had to get a, I did a tooth scan and had a cracked tooth. Which if I remember that part of the story, you'd never even had a cavity. Blood. I've had cavities, but I had no pain. I mean, I had no. You had no tooth pain or yeah, no toothache. So they, they found a cracked tooth and that's fine. I had no pain from it. Um, so the, the, the dentist at the hospital wouldn't do, he, he said that the, it couldn't have gotten into there. The tooth wasn't damaged enough to pull. He would repair it. He wasn't going to pull it. I was released from the hospital for a few days. And my very first stop was the, my dentist office. And I said, pull it. I don't, I don't care. This is the tooth, pull that tooth. Cause whatever caused this wasn't going to cause it anymore. So they pulled it and, um, I was on so many meds then I didn't have to take anything else. I mean that, but that was, I think that was the very next day I went and got that tooth pulled. Um, but the, the dentist said, you know, doctors blame teeth, but your, your tooth didn't, I'll, I'll never know. Um, I was on, was I on oral meds then or was I on? You're, you were on a, uh, on a port, you had a port, you had an IV antibiotic. So my doctor here, Dr. Fisher was. <laughs> yeah, and in other terms, Dr. Yeah. Fisher. So I had a, I had a uh, port that I was getting medicine in constantly. Um, I started getting really bad again. Well, you were home for about seven to 10 days and it started getting bad. And you were going to work during this time too. I would have episodes though where, um, and people talk about COVID now. When that first came out, that kind of freaked me out. She says I had COVID before it existed. But I could, it sounded like I was drowning. I mean, so I could hear water rushing into my head, in my ears, and I knew that it was coming on, and I would start uh, suffocating, and I couldn't breathe. Um, one, one day, it was just me. I was at home, and uh, our daughter Addie was at home, and I was just trying, like I was going to die there, but I was going to do it quietly. <laughs> but I was literally on my bedroom floor on my knees, just drowning, and... I could, I could, if I could tried hard, I could control it and calm myself down. Um, we even bought a pulse ox meter and to watch my oxygen, but my oxygen was dipping down every day. Um, so finally it got so bad one day that we went back to the hospital and, um, there were some arguments at the hospital. I had a great, I had a great team of doctors. Um, like I said, Dr. Henderson here was one of my doctors. Um, but the, uh, the surgeon and the pulmonologist disagreed on whether I should get surgery or not. Um, so on that second stay, I was just back on more meds. Um, I can't remember how long I was there, but even the day I was released that day, I had one more of those episodes at the hospital and then went home that day. I didn't even make it one day. I had a really bad episode that night. Um, and she even talks about how she had to basically carry me to the car that night. Um, I lost control of my body that night. Um, it's probably the lowest, probably the lowest I got. Um, but so that day he, he was home for about three hours before I had to take him back. Um, and I had just started a new job, uh, earlier that, that semester. And so, um, this was happening during the, my most busiest time of the year. Um, and so I have a new job. It's the busiest time of the year for, for me. Um, and I felt pretty bad you know, not being there during that. So my dad would stay with him during the day and, and I would go at lunch and then I would go after work um, and sit with him and then, um, and stay pretty late. But this, so this day my dad brings him home um, and I get home probably about an hour, hour and a half later. And as soon as I walk in the door, I can just see him and he's, he's in one of these um, episodes and I immediately go and um, get the, the pulse ox to, che to check where he's at. 
and um, and you know it's it's at home and, and who knows whether you know it's a home device so who knows what how accurate the thing is kind of like the scale right that's that's not accurate at all <laughs> um, but the pulse ox says you know that he's at about 58 and wow. I know that we're in trouble because yeah. like they want you to be like at 98 should be right? yeah, yeah, so. in the 90s yeah. yes for sure in the 90s if you get below 90 you're you're on oxygen so it's it's saying it's about 58 so regardless of you know plus or minus 10 or whatever I know we're bad um so basically I'm suff- I'm suffocating is what happened. So we're trying yeah. to get him calmed down um and I we sit there I sit with him for probably about 10 15 minutes and I'm like I you know I'm desperate at this point so that's when I reached out to Dr. Henderson and I was just like I don't know what to do like I mean at this point he hadn't um he wasn't part of our care um, so I'm trying to fill him in and just like you know we've gone to the hospital multiple times now we keep getting sent home we've just been sent home again like this is not not okay um and so um ultimately he tells me you know if, if he's not getting better in the next few minutes you've got to take him back and so I'm trying to tell him, you know, we've got to go back. We have to go back. And he's fighting me of, of I just, I don't want to go. Like, I've been there. I've done that. Like, I don't want to go back again. And um, about the time I finally convinced him that it was time to go, um, our our youngest son was in the kitchen eating. And, and so he's like, I've got to go, to, you know, I need to go to the bathroom before we, before we leave. And so I go to help him, um, help him get up. And, like, he just... He has no control of his body. He can't walk. He can't do anything. And so we go and, um, you know, he goes to the bathroom. We get uh, get him changed, get some shoes. And I'm literally pretty much carrying him to the car. And by the time I get him in the car, he um, he does – his speech is slurred like I can already – so I know that – I mean, it's, it's just probably not a good situation. Um, we get him back. I get to the ER and – um, go inside and get the wheelchair and get him in the wheelchair and take him back in and they uh, they they take him right back. Um, I mean, I literally just left. <laughs> yeah, like they just literally wheeled him right back to the um, to the back rooms and um, but through that, like uh, even that night, like trying to wash his hands, like he couldn't wash his hands, he couldn't make his hands do the movement. I couldn't brush my teeth. I couldn't. This this didn't work. <laughs> so. I, I mean, I really believed he probably had some type of small stroke or something um, that they never tested for, but we we saw the remnants of that for weeks after until he was finally able to brush his teeth or tie his shoes or do those kinds of things without problem. But um, So we were admitted back into the hospital yet again. So now the surgeon finally wins. He, they'd had enough. So uh, I ended up having a thoracotomy. So they went in through the uh, my back, and uh, I jokingly call it power washing my lungs, but they went and physically removed. So ultimately what I had was um, bilateral pneumonia, much worse on this side. Um, so they cleaned all that out. But what he talked about later was um, uh, he found there's a pocket. So I, I don't even know when this first happened, but there was a pocket in the middle right next to my heart where my body had... Uh, encapsulated the initial disease and i think what i don't blame the chiropractor at all but i think when i went in with all that pain whatever he did finally popped it but that it's it it shot onto my vocal cords which is why i lost my voice um he was able to clean most of that out um i was on a uh i'd say for about a week i had to have uh tubes draped out of me so all the fluid was leaking out of my it was it was so gross <laughs> i remember when they first told me about that i imagined myself you know being stuck leaned over with these tubes and that's basically how i, mean, I had tubes laying out of me for a few days um i will say that the next couple of days I, I i i almost instantly felt that the the drowning and all that kind of stuff stopped i was probably in the hospital for another week or two after that um other complications happened. I had uh, that port that I had over here, we think ended up pinching some nerves, so I still can't feel these two fingers. I still, my voice gets like this if I talk a lot. Um, but all in all, I'm completely better. I was released last April, uh, or you know, April of 2020, I was released. And at that time, COVID was breaking out. So, you know, she's really worried at that point. But uh, my doctor even said that 
I shouldn't get pneumonia again. I shouldn't, I'm no more susceptible to COVID than you are. Um, is this easier to say than to, to no i get and she see me on a ventilator so yeah. when they talk about ventilators i mean she watched me come off a ventilator yeah. and that night specifically when you if if you ever have to get on a ventilator when you come off you i mean you've been out and you wake up and this thing's down your throat and you can hear people talking but you can't see anything and all, and they're all yelling at me to you know i need you to stay calm if you want this taken out you have to stay calm for a while and i could hear the music i could hear the music playing i just wanted to turn it up um but they think i'm freaking out but i just i just just turn up the music and i'll be fine um i finally calmed down and eventually we got out of the hospital um my very first sunday back they played defender <laughs> they played defender um i believe amy was i believe amy prayed over me that day um and since then, um, Dr. Anderson once prayed over me during Defender, and that meant more to me than his time in the hospital. Um, I've had Leanne pray over me during Defender. Um, that song, um, it's now my Do This in Remembrance of Me song, mm-hmm. so um, I'll go up every time. Um, Talk about staying home during COVID and it's like... Do, oh, so we don't come to church, you know, because uh, we could be more susceptible to it. But uh, So we watch the first service, and then if Defender plays, I know when it's playing, so I come up during the second service so I can go to the altar. Um, I was at a – part of what I do is I sell uh, espresso machines and stuff to places, and there's a church here called uh, the Worship Center. I'd sold them a machine. And one Sunday they called, and they had a problem with it, so I rushed up there. And when I got there, Defender's playing in the lobby. And I said, is this being played in this church? And she said, yeah, they're singing it right now. They just they played a loudspeaker. So I said, hang on, I got to go. And she probably thought I was crazy. But I walked in the middle of that church, went right down to the altar, and, and sat there for that song. But um, the most important part of the song now is uh, when, when I thought I lost me, he knew where I, he knew where I left me, and he put me back together. Yeah. Yeah. It's, this is a it's a miracle. I mean, seriously, your healing is is miraculous. It's miraculous healing, and um, but this part of just how God worked through this song and this worship song, and and just for people listening and don't didn't catch this part of the story. So, anytime defenders playing in this church or I guess any, any church other now, church. <laughs> you're down at the front and you are kneeling, your hands are raised, you are worshiping, and. So I've known you for a long time, Jeff. So like, I, I know that you love music and you've worshipped. But uh, is it fair to say your worship's gone to a whole new level? Oh too? yeah, um, it, it's gone to a whole new level, and um, it's not even only that song. I hear other songs now that um, you know that bring 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 that out in me now. I guess um, it probably shouldn't be this way, but I, you come closer to God at your lowest moments. <laughs> Who are you going to turn to when you're on a hospital bed? Yeah. Miserable. Um, so I, I, I mean, again, I've been coming here for 20 years, but I wasn't, I'm not near as close to God. Or I wasn't near as close to God as I am now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the reason we wanted to interrupt this podcast the way we normally do and um, get your story out is because we've been doing some teaching and preaching on worship and, and really going to a whole new level of worship and, and what that looks like and what that means. And, I, I just I want your story to be told because I think um, when God intervenes in your life and and literally miraculously heals you, your worship can't help but go to a new level, and right. the lyrics can't help but take on a whole new meaning. Um, but I, I think the point that we need to hang on to here is that that doesn't have to be a physical miraculous healing. Um, God's healed all of us, and. Um, in that way, we, we should be able to take our worship to a whole new level um, and not just come in and worship and go through the motions or, or whatever it may be. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite parts of your story is, uh, uh, at least here at Aldersgate, we, we have an emergency response team. And so um, 
they're trained when they see any kind of strange movement or anything happening that uh, they need to respond. And um, I know one of the Sundays, uh, not knowing that you would go to the front. Um, you played of it the, out of order. You played we, it we, for the second we, <laughs> we We did things a little out of order and um, played defender. And here you come rushing to the front. Like, this is what you always do, but like you come rushing to the front to kneel down and worship. And, um, but when they saw this strange man rushing towards the front of the stage turn worship, they kind of converged on you. And so now we kind of have a funny joke that anytime defenders played, hey, give the emergency response team a heads up that Jeff Fisher is going to be down at the altar. But, um, man, we just we just love that, and, and we, we love your testimony of, of what God's done through this, this gosh, just this story. And I and I really appreciate you being willing to, to share um, the story and um, to walk through this. I know it's not easy for you guys to walk through this over and over and again, but um, I know your story is going to touch a lot of people. Um, what, what would you say to people who might be hesitant to worship with everything they've got? Like, what, what would you say to people who maybe hold back? because Don't what other worry about who's around. It's, it's your relationship with God and Jesus. It's not about mary next door it's it's not about anybody watching you i'm i'm not worried about getting tackled as i go up there if you want to tackle me go for it um <laughs> it's just about your relationship with god yeah it's, it's you and him yeah because lots of people were instrumental in this healing journey of yours oh definitely but ultimately we know god was your healer and um that's I, I think i'm not trying to put words in your mouth but that's why now you can say it's between me and God, and it doesn't have anything yes. to do with oh, anybody else. Yeah. And, um, yeah, everybody that helped along the way, I mean, he, he put them he put them there. Yeah. Leanne, anything else you would add to that? I I mean, just kind of reiterate what Jeff says. Is it, I mean, it's just a, um, a true act of just obedience and um, faithfulness on our part, I, I believe. I mean, I, even with, um, you know, I, I've... I feel like my worship has even changed through his, you know, just his journey. Mm -hmm. And um, so we just, I play music all day in my office and I all find myself even in my office, just standing there and raising my hands or singing along. And, um, and I just, it's kind of become just my all day prayer, you know, just listening to the music, listening to the lyrics and just me singing along as just a continuation of prayer throughout the day. Um, and I can just feel the difference. I can feel the difference on the days when I um, listen to the music and you know sing and 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 I'm thoughtful in in what I'm saying and singing. Um, and when I don't, you know, we, during the summer, I, I tend to I turned music it's more to kind of it's pool time in the summer. So I'd turn the music more to some you know pool top music and um, and I noticed. A difference. I just felt that difference mm. as soon as I started playing, you know, my my regular radio stations again. You just feel that difference, and and you're like, that's why. That's why mm. I do this. Is I, I can feel that connection. I feel closer to my, you know, to God in my relationship with Him. And so, um, I truly believe worship is is one of the most important things that we can do. Mm. Yeah, and I would add to that, I, I don't think your story's only like changed Leanne's view of worship. I think it's changed my view of worship, and I think it's changed a lot of people's view of worship, especially those who know your story, which is why we wanted you to tell your story. Sure. And when why we wanted as many people as possible to hear your story, because we believe it can change everyone's view of worship. And so, again, I just I just want to say thank you uh, for coming and sharing your story and, and, and walking us through that again. Like I said, I know it's not always easy, but... Um, but you're a, a testimony to God's goodness. And um, Amen. I think that's why you worship so freely. And so I, I hope that all of us can catch that testimony as well. So, so thanks to the Fishers. Appreciate you guys very much. And I, I hope that um, this has been meaningful and important to you as well. And I hope that what you'll do with it from this point forward uh, is to remember the places God's been good to you. Remember the places God's healed you, whether it be physically or your soul, or spiritually, whatever it may be, um, and worship Him with everything that you've got. Thanks for being with us. <laughs>